In section 4.2, we're going to seemingly switch to an entirely different subject from 4.1, where we're trying to find an antiderivative or undo a derivative uh, to find an original function. And in this lesson, we're now going to start talking about uh, approximating the area under a curve. Uh, in 4.3, uh, this will make a little more sense why 4.1 and 4.2 seemingly have nothing to do with each other. Um, but again, in this lesson, we're going to try to do something unrelated to 4.1, and that is approximate the area under a curve. So just a quick reminder of the two questions of calculus that we talked way back in chapter one about. Uh, the first question was, how do you find instantaneous velocity or rate of change? And we quickly saw in chapter two that the answer to that was the derivative. Uh, the derivative was given by that uh, limit formula. And of course, visually, we realized that the derivative uh, represented the slope of a tangent line. The second question, though, of calculus was how do you find the area of complex shapes? So, of course, we're not talking about a rectangle where we know the formula is just simply base times height. We're talking about, you know, weird shapes that there are no formulas for, and we would want to know the area of, but we don't really have formulas that take care of that. While we're not ready to find the exact area under these uh, shapes or of these shapes, um, maybe we can approximate them uh, as the title of this uh, section would imply. Okay, so we're going to approximate the area under a curve. So when we're trying to approximate the area of a complicated region, we're going to use some simpler shapes that we can uh, deal with so that we can approximate the area. And in this case, we're going to use rectangles. So I guess there's some extra words that should be added to the title of this section. Uh, we're going to approximate the area under the curve, but of course it's not going to go on forever, uh, or I guess the area would just be infinite. Uh, really, we got to think about this uh, from this viewpoint. We're approximating the area under a curve, but above the x-axis, as you can see in this first picture here. So we're trying to find the area under this function curve, which we don't know, from A to B. And in this case, I'm going to use two rectangles that I'm going to indicate with R1 and R2 um, to approximate this area. And you can see right away, this is not going to be a very good approximation, but it'll be an approximation nevertheless. So big R and uh, big R1 and big R2 represent the area of each rectangle. So big R1 is the area of the first rectangle. Big R2 is the area of the second rectangle. If I wanted to find that total area, of course, we would just add those two areas together, and that would give us an approximation for the area under the curve, but above the x-axis. Of course, we're not really so concerned with the accuracy of this approximation. So that's kind of it. We would just add those two areas up, and we'd get that approximation. Now, we're only adding two areas here, but you can quickly see if we started adding up 3, 4, 5, 10, 20, 30 areas, writing R1 plus R2 plus R3 dot 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 would become very tedious. So hopefully remember last year in pre-cal, you guys studied summation notation. Um, and that's what we're going to use here as a shorthand way of writing that out. So as a similar way of writing it, we can use this summation notation. And if I translate this for you, what this is saying is we want to sum up or add all the areas of the rectangles from 1 to 2. That's all that means. So hopefully you're still up to speed uh, with that summation notation. Okay, what if we didn't want to use two rectangles but four rectangles? Uh, you can kind of appreciate, um, while that's not going to give us the exact area, it's definitely a little bit better than using two rectangles. So the area now would be R1 plus R2 plus R3 plus R4. But again, you can see how tedious this can become writing out R1 plus R2 plus R3 plus R4. So we're going to use summation notation to write this as well. The area is the summation or adding up of all the areas of the rectangles from 1 to 4. That's how you translate that notation. And I'm just using the little subscript i to indicate uh, each of the rectangles. So we plug in 1, plug in 2, plug in 3, and then we stop at 4 because uh, that's where the summation notation stops at. Uh, so like I was saying a moment ago, uh, you can appreciate that as we add more and more rectangles, our approximation becomes more and more and more accurate. 
So in this case, we have even more rectangles. While again, it's not an exact area under the curve, but above the x-axis, it's getting a lot better than when we first started off with two rectangles. So in this case, there are 12 rectangles, so you can see right away why summation notation is definitely a better way to write this out. Uh, showing we're adding R1 to R12 uh, doesn't even fit in this little space right here, and it's just, of course, tedious to write that out. So definitely summation, summation notation here uh, helps us out a lot. Uh, again, this is saying, uh, this notation, that we're trying to sum up or add all the areas of the rectangles from one to 12. Okay, so some things we can maybe realize about these pictures. You'll notice that the base or the length of the base for these rectangles in the first picture are wider than in the second picture. And then same can be said about the third picture compared to the second picture. The bases of each of the rectangles are smaller and smaller. So maybe you noticed as the number of rectangles increases, the length of the bases approach zero. They're getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And of course, if you're going to put a billion rectangles in there, then that base would be very, very small. Maybe at some point we'll be looking to put an infinite number of rectangles, and that's eventually where we're going to go in 4.3. By taking the limit of the lengths of those bases as they approach zero, you're thinking about putting an infinite amount of rectangles under the curve. I'm getting a little bit ahead by mentioning that, but that's where we're trying to go in 4.3. We want to eventually find the exact area under the curve, so we have to think about putting an infinite amount of rectangles under the curve and trying to add those up. So one little note to make about problems, um, you won't see any examples like this in this uh, uh, video, but you definitely will run into problems like this. It's convenient, but it's not required to have the intervals or the base of the rectangles be equal length. In these three examples I did, all the bases of the rectangles have equal length, but it's not always the case in all the problems you're going to be looking at. Kind of to summarize this entire idea uh, and concept before we look at some examples, um, just realize this. The sum of the areas of all the rectangles you use, whether it's 2, whether it's 12, or whether it's 1,000, approximates the actual area of the region. And that's the key word. It's just an approximation. Until we put an infinite, num infinite number of rectangles in, which will be in 4.3, um, we really aren't getting the exact value. Okay, there are three ways we're going to use rectangles to approximate the area under a curve. And I'm going to do all three methods with the exact same picture so we can kind of compare how each one uh, behaves and how each one is set up. Uh, so what are we trying to do? We want to approximate the area under our x squared function from 0 to 3 with six sub intervals. A little bit of vocabulary here, subintervals is just another way of saying, in these problems, rectangles. So we want to put six rectangles from 0 to 3. And of course, if we divide up that region from 0 to 3 into six pieces, each of these rectangles is a half unit wide. So the first way we're going to try to find, or we're, first way we're going to approximate area under this curve, but above the x-axis, is to use what is called a left endpoint rectangular approximation method. That is, of course, a mouthful, so you're going to hear me refer to that method just as LRAM. The way we're going to set these rectangles up, though, uh, is the important thing, and that way is dictated by this left endpoint. That's the reason it's called a left endpoint rectangular approximation method. We're going to draw these rectangles using the left endpoint of each of these intervals. Okay, so that being said, we need to set up these rectangles, and you'll notice uh, the first rectangle, which would go from 0 to 0.5, if you use the left endpoint to set up that rectangle, our graph is at 0, 0. So there is really no rectangle from 0 to 0.5. So this was kind of a weird way to start, considering there's no rectangle in this first region here. But our next region is from 0.5 to 1. That rectangle is going to be drawn by uh, going from 0 0.5, which is right here, and going up till we hit our function. If we go across and come down, that would draw our first rectangle. 
to draw the next rectangle, which goes from 1 to 1.5, we would start at the bottom at 1, go up till we hit the curve, go over, and come down. That draws our next rectangle. At 1.5 to 2, we're going to use that left endpoint, which would be 1.5, go up till we hit the curve, draw over, and come down again. From 2 to 2.5, we'll use the left end point at 2 to go up and hit the curve, come over, come down, and that draws the next rectangle, and so on to get that last one. So you can see we have six rectangles, or so to speak, six, six rectangles. That first rectangle didn't really exist since the left end point at 0 doesn't give us a height at all. Okay, so when you really think about this, if we're trying to approximate the area under this curve, we just need to find the area of six rectangles and add them up. But of course, as soon as we take regular geometry problems that you guys could do and put them in our XY plane, uh, you can kind of complicate things more than they need to be. So how should we be viewing area of rectangles? Well, of course, the area of a rectangle is base times height, as most of you learned. I'm gonna just write it as height times base and it's gonna be more for a convenience for something you're gonna see later. So what is the height of these rectangles and what is the base of these rectangles? Well, you might have noticed as I drew each of these rectangles, I said I would start at uh, the left endpoint and go up till we hit the curve. Of course, when you go up from an X value uh, until you hit your curve, you're talking about F of X, that is your function, that is the Y value of the height of that rectangle. The base of these uh, rectangles I'm going to call delta x, a little change of x, like we've done many times in this class. So first thing you're going to have to realize is while you know the area of a rectangle is base times height, the way we're going to look at it in this lesson is it's going to be a y value, which is f of x, times a x value, which will be a change of x of delta x. Okay, so what is our function in this particular problem? Well, f of x is equal to x squared. This is, again, our f of x. Our change of x, the base of each of these rectangles, is half a unit. Once you kind of get that figured out, I'm going to have you guys set up all your problems the way I'm going to do these. It just keeps it organized and easier to read for everybody. So what we're going to do is kind of write out each of the rectangles and find those areas. So our first rectangle goes from 0 to 0.5. The height of that rectangle was uh, determined by using the left endpoint. So we're going to plug in our left endpoint into the function to find the height. But of course that makes sense. We already knew the height was 0. And again, the change of x for that rectangle, the width or the base of that rectangle was 0.5. Our next rectangle, R2, exists from 0.5 to 1. In this case, we drew that rectangle using the left endpoint at 0.5. So the height of that rectangle would be 0.5 plugged into our function, x squared, so 0.5 squared. And again, luckily, our change of x is still the same. Our third rectangle exists from 1 to 1.5. The way we drew that rectangle is we started at the left endpoint of 1 and went up till we hit our function. To find the height of that rectangle, we would just plug that x value into our function, and in this case that would be 1 squared. Our fourth rectangle exists from 1.5 to 2. To draw that rectangle, we started at our left endpoint of 1.5, we went up till we hit the curve, and to find that height, or that y value, we would plug the x value into our function, 1.5 squared, times our delta x. Our fifth rectangle exists from 2 to 2.5. To find the height of that rectangle, we started at our left endpoint of 2, and we went up till we hit the function. To find that y value, we need to plug 2 into our function, which is uh, 2 squared. And the last rectangle um, exists from 2.5 to 3. To find the height of that rectangle, we started at the left end point of 2.5. We went up till we hit the function. So to find the height of that rectangle, we need to plug our x value in of 2.5 into our function. So that would be 2.5 squared times 0.5. There you go. All of our areas of rectangles are set up. 
we of course can just use a calculator to calculate all this. Uh, I'm not going to calculate each area individually for the sake of space, but when you sum up all the areas of those rectangles from 1 to 6, you'll get an area of 6.875. And again, keep in mind, we, we're going to round to three decimal places. So there you go. The uh, approximation for the area under this function is 6.875. And you can see visually that, of course, is not going to be the exact area. Um, there are these little blank spaces left using these rectangles, so that should be under the actual value. Just to give you an appreciation for how close this approximation is, it turns out the actual area under this curve but above the x-axis from 0 to 3 is equal to 9. Okay, hopefully you understood uh, that last uh, example. Uh, and on these next two slides, I'm going to go much, much quicker uh, through the process because the only thing that's changing is just the way we're setting up these rectangles. Everything else is perfectly identical. It's just how we approach setting up the rectangles to approximate the area under a curve. In this case, we're going to use what is called a right endpoint rectangular approximation. So again, same exact problem x squared from 0 to 3, and we're using six rectangles. So again, uh, it's a mouthful to say uh, right endpoint rectangular approximation method. So we're just going to say RM for short. To draw these rectangles, we're going to use the right endpoint to draw the rectangle. So in this case, we're going to start on the right side. Our last rectangle exists from 2.5 to 3. So if we start at the right endpoint of 3 and go up till we hit our function and come over and down, that'll draw the first rectangle. If we go from 2 to 2.5, which would be the next one, we would start at 2.5, go up till we hit our function, which would be right here, come over and down, and that draws the next one, and so on and so forth. And you'll notice in this problem, we will have a rectangle from 0 to 0.5, even though it's going to be kind of hard to draw in. If we start at 0.5 and go up and we hit the curve, that is going to draw a tiny little rectangle. Its height will be 0.5 squared, um, but we will have a rectangle there. So just like the last slide, um, nothing has changed. The formula for finding the area of rectangle is the same. And again, we're looking at it in terms of f of x times delta x. And in this case, our function is still x squared, and the width of each of these rectangles is still 0.5. So again, our first rectangle is from 0 to 0.5, but here we use the right endpoint to determine the height of this rectangle. To determine the height of this rectangle, we went up till we hit the curve, and we came over and then down. So that would mean the height of this rectangle is determined by uh, the y value of our function. So we're going to go ahead and plug in that right endpoint into our function to find the height of the rectangle. And we're going to just keep on going like we did with all the other rectangles from before. The only thing different about each of these rectangles is to, de to, is to determine the height of them. We're now using the right endpoint. So if you want to find the height at the right endpoint of these rectangles, we need to take the right endpoint and plug it into our function. So you'll notice we're just taking the right endpoint of each of these intervals and plugging them into our function of x squared. So here we're going to take our right endpoint of 2, plug it in, so 2 squared. We're going to take our right endpoint of 2.5 and plug it into our function to find the height, which would be 2.5 squared. And for the last one, we'll plug in the right endpoint of 3 into our function to find the height, so that'll be 3 squared times 0.5. Again, it's not going to be the exact area under the curve, but ultimately we want to add up all these areas from 1 to 6. And this total, again, to three decimal places is 11.375. And that shouldn't be a surprise. In that last slide, you saw the actual area should be 9. And the way these rectangles were drawn, there's, I guess they're hanging outside of the actual area under the curve. So of course this uh, approximation should be greater than 9. And of course it turns out to be greater than 9. Okay, the last method we're going to use to approximate the area under a, cur under a curve uh, is called the midpoint rectangular approximation method, or again for short, uh, we're going to just say AMRAM.
Same like we did in the previous two slides, we're going to use six rectangles to approximate the area under x squared from 0 to 3. Okay, so again, nothing's changed. What's going to dictate how we draw these rectangles, though, is now we're going to look at the midpoint in each of these intervals to dictate how tall these rectangles are. And you'll notice with this little red dash right here that I drew, the midpoint between 2.5 and 3 is right there. So what we're going to do is start at that midpoint, go up till we hit the curve, which would be up here, and then we'll go over and down to draw that rectangle. The next midpoint, which is right here, we're going to go up till we hit the curve, which is right around here, and then we'll go over and down to draw that next rectangle, and so on and so forth. Each of the midpoints of these intervals will dictate how tall each of these rectangles turn out to be. So if we go up from this midpoint till we hit the curve, we can use that to draw the rectangle there, and so on and so forth. And again, in this first little region from 0 to 0.5, we will have a rectangle. It's going to be a very, very tiny rectangle, but ultimately it's still going to be a rectangle there because there's a midpoint between 0 and 0.5 that we can go up to draw that rectangle. Okay, so again, the area of a rectangle, the way we're viewing it in these problems, is not base times height or height times base, but a y value, which is f of x, times delta x. And in this case, our function f of x is the function x squared. And the width of each of these rectangles, or the change of x, delta x, is 0.5. So, the area of the first rectangle, which goes from 0 to 0.5, was dictated by going up from the midpoint till we hit the curve. So to find the height from that midpoint, we would take that midpoint and plug it into our function. In this case, the midpoint between 0 and 0.5 is 0.25. And when we plug it into x squared, that'll be 0.25 squared. The second rectangle, the way we drew that one, is using the midpoint. The midpoint between 0.5 and 1 is 0.75. So to find the height of that rectangle, we're going to take that x value and plug it into the function. So 0.75 squared times our delta x of 0.5. Third rectangle exists from 1 to 1.5. The midpoint between 1 and 1.5 is 1.25. To find the height of that rectangle, it'll be 1.25 squared. The next rectangle is from 1.5 to 2. The midpoint uh, between 1.5 and 2 is 1.75, and so on and so forth. I think you can catch the pattern uh, really quick. So what is the approximation using this method? Well, it might be a little hard to tell, I guess, by looking at this picture. Is it going to be over the actual value of 9, or is it going to be under the actual value of 9? Well, when you take all of these areas and add them up, all the areas from 1 to 6 and add them up, you'll get 8.9375. Remarkably close to the actual value of 9. So one big common misconception that you might possibly make here, uh, so I definitely want to address it before we go on to the error in these approximations, is uh, I guess something you might think is common sense, but unless you want to try this out, you can just take my word for this. MRAM, unfortunately, is not the average of LRAM and RRAM. It might make sense, uh, until you think about it more possibly, but it might make sense that MRAM might just be an average of LRAM and RRAM. Uh, but if you want to check the math and see for yourself, you'll see that it's actually not. Uh, so don't make that uh, little mistake of thinking MRAM is just taking LRAM and RRAM and averaging those two together. Okay, so now let's take a look at how these approximations get better and better with more and more rectangles. Uh, so you'll notice right here in this first row of this table uh, were the ones we did in the previous three slides. When you use six rectangles, LRAM is uh, 6.875, MRAM is a little bit better, and RRAM goes over the actual value of 9. Uh, at 12 rectangles, you can tell LRAM is still not very good, MRAM getting better, and RRAM still not too good. It really becomes apparent right at about, I guess I would say, 48 rectangles that MRAM almost becomes exact. You guys saw that uh, the exact value was 9 for the area under the curve, and with just 48 rectangles, MRAM is at 8.999, which is remarkably close to the actual value. 
you'll notice you don't get much better going up to a thousand rectangles. But if you take a look at LRAM and RAM, it takes about a thousand rectangles for this to become even which you, most of you would consider a good approximation. MRAM only took it about 48 rectangles, but LRAM and RRAM take about 1,000 rectangles. Uh, so you'll never be asked to choose uh, a number of rectangles to use. Uh, so this table just kind of serves as a way to give you an appreciation for uh, these uh, three different rectangular approximation methods. So quite frequently on AP test questions, you'll be asked to uh, figure out if your error is an under approximation or an over approximation, or I guess that is to say if your um, error is under or over the actual value. So the way we're going to determine that is not by concavity, but uh, by whether the function is increasing or decreasing. So you'll notice in the example we did in the previous three slides, if you're looking at an increasing function, LRAM turns out to be an under approximation. The other way that you can describe these rectangles, because it might appear this way from time to time, is they might be referred to as inscribed rectangles because they are all underneath the curve. If you're dealing with RAM and an increasing function, you can see that you have an over approximation. When your rectangles are kind of outside of the curve that you're looking at, they are called circumscribed rectangles. And then you can kind of imagine if you have a decreasing function, these two um, approximations kind of switch in their error. If you're dealing with LRAM and a decreasing function, now that is an over approximation, and those are circumscribed rectangles. When you're looking at RRAM and a decreasing function, now, you're, now you have an under approximation, and those are inscribed rectangles. Okay, in this last slide and last example, we're going to take a look at an AP test practice problem. And just to kind of point out uh, one big difference between this example and the one I used to do LRAM, RM, and MRAM, is that in, the, in that example, they gave us the function, which happened to be x squared. Uh, in this problem, which you guys have kind of seen a lot, we're not given a function, but we're given a table of values instead. And usually that'll make the problem a lot easier because you don't have to worry about plugging in an x value into a function and kind of computing that. So just something to point out before we get into this problem. So what's the situation we have going on here? During an eight hour cruise, a ship consumes fuel at the rate F given in the table above. What is the approximation of the total fuel consumption in gallons over the eight hours using a midpoint Riemann sum with four subintervals of equal width. Okay, so right away you might be noticing there is a word that we've not seen at all in this lesson, and I've purposely held off from using it till it'll make more sense maybe in 4.3. So you just need to know for now that when we say something called midpoint Riemann sum, that's just another way of saying the midpoint rectangular approximation method or MRAM. You saw that sub is just another way, another way of saying rectangles. So we're going to have four rectangles of equal width. And again, one more reminder, they don't have to be equal width. Uh, in some problems, uh, the width of each of the rectangles uh, will be different. In this particular problem, they're all going to be a width of two since our interval goes from zero to eight. So let's take a look at each of those rectangles and set up our format for these problems. Our first rectangle goes from zero to two so we're going to go ahead and set that up from 0 to 2 and call that R1. Our next rectangle exists from 2 to 4, so we'll set that up below that. Our next rectangle goes from 4 to 6, so that'll be R3. And our last rectangle, of course, goes from 6 to 8, since all of these rectangles need to be 2 units wide, since uh, we need to have 4 subintervals of equal width. And again, just one more reminder, please set up your problems just like this. Uh, do it vertically and list it out nice and neat, uh, and it'll make everything a little bit more organized. Okay, so how do we find the area of each of these rectangles? As a quick reminder, uh, that is the new formula, so to speak, for the area of a rectangle. No longer are we writing it as base times height or height times base. We need to view it as a function value, a y value, f of x, times a change of x. In this problem, uh, we have some different letters with the T's and the capital F's. So I'm going to go ahead and change my area of a rectangle formula uh, to represent that. The area of a rectangle, I'm going to write as capital R, 
our f of x is not little f of x, it's actually capital F of t. And of course, our x in this uh, particular problem is time, so it's going to be a delta t. Luckily, the delta t is always the same for all of these rectangles, so we can kind of make this even simpler and just say the area of each rectangle is big F of t times 2. Okay, so we want to use a midpoint Riemann sum to find the area of the first rectangle, which exists from 0 to 2. We want to determine the height of our function at the midpoint. The midpoint between 0 and 2 is 1, so the height would be f, capital F of 1 times 2 to give us the area. The y value, or the height of this rectangle at 1, would be 130, and when you multiply that by 2, we'll get 260. The midpoint between 2 and 4 is, of course, 3. So to find the height of the rectangle at that x value, we would want to evaluate capital F of 3. Based on the table, that's 118. So to find the area, 118 times 2 is 236. To find the uh, height of the rectangle from 4 to 6, we use the midpoint, which is 5. To find the height of that rectangle, we'll evaluate capital F at 5. And from the table, that's 108. To find the area times 2 would be 216. And for the last rectangle, uh, the midpoint, which is giving us the height of this rectangle, is at 7. So to find the y value or the height of this rectangle, we would need to figure out capital F of 7. Based on the table, that's 120. Times 2 to find the area is 240. And when we sum up all the areas of the rectangles from 1 to 4, we get a grand total of 952, and don't forget the units here, uh, gallons. It's 952 gallons. So, not too bad. A uh, very typical AP kind of problem. And just to kind of give you uh, one other view of this problem, what if the question had asked us to do a right endpoint Riemann sum? Well, if we do a right endpoint Riemann sum, the only thing that's changing is now we're finding the height at the right endpoint. So instead of looking at the midpoint, uh, the y value at the midpoint, we're looking for the y value at the right endpoint. So in all of these cases, we're just going to plug in the right endpoint. So capital F of 2 is 116, capital F of 4 is 110, capital F of 6 is 109, and capital F of 8 is 125. If you take all of those and multiply by 2 and add them up, summing up all those areas of the rectangles from 1 to 4 give you 920 gallons instead. We could have easily done this with a left endpoint Riemann sum or rectangular approximation method. In that case, we would have just plugged in the left endpoint and done the exact same process.